you got suspended how long? A game. A game? A game. And my, uh, t- my teammates held it down because I could have cost us yeah. that series real easily. Would you do it again? Yep. Why? Yep, because it had to happen. There, I mean, that shit had to happen, right? Like, there are moments in life where I, I try to tell my kids, like, there are going to be repercussions for that, for what you have to do. Right. And you will have to live with those. That doesn't mean that doesn't have to be done. Right. And that shit had to be done. Real talk. Here we go. We back, man. Investor die. We sitting here with Raja Bell. We we went to Caneville football. We went to basketball today. You know what I'm saying? We still here with Raja Bell. Um, I know a lot of y'all probably don't even realize Raja Bell is from Miami, but y'all hear the name. We are gonna get into the stories and then it 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 <laughs> it it it'll, it'll, it'll hit you. Um, Raja, you at American Heritage now, right? Yep. Um, you coach basketball at American Heritage. Coach basketball, yes, I do. Think the Miami this this, this, this Miami basketball scene is coming back. Yeah, I think. Uh, you know, like I, when we came up, we didn't really have that grassroots cats that had played in college or in mm-hmm. the NBA or even right. high school teaching us from, from our baby stages. Yeah. We only got them in high school. So um, I think it's better set up now for these young kids. There are a lot of young brothers giving back in the community, mm-hmm. running programs, teaching right. kids how to play the right way. And I think you'll see that continue to trickle up. There were a few down years for sure right. from, from when we came out. There always been steady product, but... Maybe not the amount, uh-huh. but I think you'll see it be coming back in a big way soon. Yeah. They already started with the with the Boozer twins and right, some right. of these really good young players around Data Broward. Right. Did um how long were you at American Heritage? Oh, uh, this will be my fourth year coming up. Did you get Dallas Turner to play for you? Dallas played, <laughs> yeah. I did. I couldn't hold on to him. I got him. I got him. And Delon is my guy. Delon, if you're listening, that's my that's my family, man. We got him for half a season. Um and then uh, he decided he wanted to go play, you know, at St. Thomas, which which we respected. And yeah. we knew he was going – at that point, you know, Dallas thought he was going to be basketball and football. Right. I think he had come to the realization that it was going to be football. football. And so he was trying to protect his interests. What did you – did you see? Because the first time I saw him, he fucking did a windmill standing still. And I was like, holy crap, he was a freshman. Mm-hmm. He could have been what? Because he's only like, what, 6'2", 6'1", but he jumps out of the gym, he's strong. Yeah, he's an ox. So we got, when, when he was coming off of ACL when I got there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, DeLon, again, had been telling me about him. He was playing with a really elite uh, AAU team. Uh, AAU team. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I got him in the gym, worked him out a couple of times, and we were like, oh, yeah, this is, yes, sir, we're going to be just fine. <laughs> we, had, we had Andrew Volmar at the time, who was, right. who was at FIU. So we had a what we thought was going to be a really good team, and then... Uh, it took a minute to come over because they had to run into the into the states. Right. Um, and when they got there, we were we were rolling. Dallas had won MVP of uh, of uh, I think it was the Cruel Classic. Uh-huh. He just put put That's work on a couple. Yeah, too. put work on just coming down and you know doing whatever he wanted basically. Right. Um, and then he got hurt. He rolled his ankle and and it was hard really to get back into flow. So. Uh-huh. I think if he had committed to playing basketball, mm-hmm. he would have been playing at a high level Division really? One program what position? right now. You think he's what position in college? I think he would have been a, a, a big three, probably big body three. He's about six three, maybe a, maybe yeah, two. Yeah, about six three. Obviously, his body would have been a different shape mm-hmm. at that point. But he was really twitchy, had a great feel, right? Um, and we'll put you in the hole in a heartbeat. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. So you talk about us as kids. Let's go back a little bit. You started at Gulliver, right? Mm-hmm. Did you play at Gulliver? Like I did. You I did play. At Gulliver? I did. I played what my grade? my tenth grade year. I was at you know middle school was eighth and ninth grade. Right. So I did eighth and ninth at Ponce de Leon, and then uh, I went to Gulliver for tenth grade, and mm-hmm. I, I was there. I think I started at the three. Um, we were we were okay. Nothing mm-hmm. special. Right. Uh, Coach Schusterman was just trying to build his program out, and uh, you know my dad was involved, and yeah. he kind of saw the writing on the wall yeah. for what it was going to be at, at Gulliver. <laughs> And he got me up out of there, and you know. Killian. <laughs> yeah. What was that, Killian? Um, Killian had a point guard then, or did Killian you... had the leading scorer in the county. What was his name? It, Warren Anderson. We called him Gigi. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so Gigi got a lot of buckets, and we did we did the tour. I make fun of it, but I probably shouldn't. All these kids doing the tours, yeah. and, <laughs> but I did that shit back in '92 when we went from school to school to school. We went to Miami High, we went to South Ridge, we went to Coral Gables, and then we went to uh, Killian. Right. And Bob Kaufman could could definitively say that when it's your turn, uh-huh. he'd give it to you. Right. Because Gigi was doing it. He was leading the county, and right. that's what I did. So that's where I went because mm-hmm. I was trying to get those buckets. So now you're a junior. Now I'm a junior now at Kill. But I got to wait my turn because Gigi's right. a senior. <laughs> right, so, right. <laughs> so we did that. Uh, we our, our rival, so Huey Futch was at Dade. Man, I was going to bring come in here and talk to you about Huey Fudge. Yeah. I'm glad you brought him the yeah. name. Cold. Cold. I'm glad you brought the name. Um, 
Huey Fudge was at Dade South. Um, you had Charlie Miller, James Colsey, mm -hmm. uh, Harrell and them. They were at South Miami. Right. You had a young Brent Wright, an old Yodi Skipper. Uh, yeah, over at Miami High. <laughs> right, right. So right. we had... <laughs> Damien yeah, you had Damien and, and, and right. the crew at Edison. And so, uh, you know, we were a good team, but I think I don't think we got out of, of districts that year. We lost maybe to South Miami or somebody like that. Yeah. Um, Ch Charlie, it seems like I, Charlie Miller, Huey Fudge, these names, Lucas Barnes, mm -hmm. right? Um, Tim James may have been, you know what I'm saying, other than you, like, it may have been one of the ones who went, went the furthest. Um, Huey Fudge. Why was why don't we remember Huey Fudge? As because I remember New Orleans going to play Huey Fudge and Martin Roka was going walk through. They were getting ready to go play him and he's got mad at the team. He was like, "Shut the fuck up! This motherfucker will beat you himself." <laughs> and me and Frog was like freshmen. We were, we were on the JV, but we were looking like, "Who the fuck are we about to go play?" Mm -hmm. And we went to go play him. He was like six five, six six, dark as night. Yeah. But he was as smooth as anything you've ever seen. Yeah. Do you know much? Talk, talk to us about Huey Fudge, because the history isn't there. Like, Yeah. So I know Huey just to be in gyms with Huey. Like, we don't yeah. have a real personal relationship, but uh -huh. you described him perfect. Right, right. He was as smooth a high school basketball player as I had ever seen, maybe still to this day. Like, because, right. I mean, he would get on top of the rim, and he'll put you in the hole, but he did it in a way that didn't look real, like, <laughs> you know, it was it just was smooth. Finesse. It was, yeah, it was cold. <laughs> right, and, right. And uh, he had a little supporting cast. He had Corey Vega and a couple other pieces around him. And what I think happened to Huey when he got away, I don't think, you know, sometimes fit is important. Talk I think to it you. happened to Charlie, too, when right. he went away, because Charlie chose to go to Bob Knight. Right. Um, I'm good friends with Charlie. I don't know who steered him there, but I, Charlie could have been a pro, too. Nobody just, knows who steered him there. We all were. Yeah. <laughs> we all it was were just, looking like. <laughs> you know, it was just a bad fit. And so right. I think Temple, and he, I wanted to go to Temple, too. I was a John Chaney fan. Uh -huh. um, I think that might have stifled Huey's Game in one way or another, you know what I'm saying? So, okay, so let's because a lot of kids football bill came from the kids. A lot of kids watch this stuff. Yeah. Explain what you're saying. You pick a top school, right? Indiana top basketball school in the nation. Mm -hmm. You figure you go play For basketball sure. there, but what do, do people miss when they pick colleges? What is it that they're missing? Yeah, you, well, what they're missing is like, how do I fit into the equation? Uh -huh. um, like, is the style of play something that's going to benefit me? Right. Um, you know, a lot of times, and this is. These are grown people dealing with kids. Um, Bingo. They're putting kids in boxes for their own personal, <laughs> right. you know, goals. Right. And, you know, you got to be very wary about figuring out whether or not your goals align with his for you personally. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And the teams. And so a lot of times a kid will just pick a place because they like the uniforms. Or, you know what I mean? Like, real talk. They'll, they'll pick them because they like the uniforms. Right. Or they're a top 25 program. And so, you know, my story was I always found it you know, interesting in retrospect because I wanted to go to Duke and North Carolina. Like, that's where I wanted to go. Right. And I only had real mid-major interest mm -hmm. at, as a junior. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I started, you know, averaging a whole lot of points as a senior. And the bigger schools came around. The Temples came around. The Georgetowns came down. And LSU offered. And so I had those schools. But something in my gut was it wasn't right. Like, that ain't real. It's not right. Like, right. you're in here late. You know, you're trying to sell me on a dream. And I knew if I went mid-major, I'd play right away. And I get a lot of opportunity to do what I did. And this was in 94. Yeah. Like, because these decisions are still the same. They're, They're not. Same. Yeah, they haven't changed. So you decided to go where? I went to Boston University. How did it work out for you? Um, it was good. And they were the first team on me. Um, I was rookie of the year in the conference. Uh, I got to play at the USA uh, Olympic Festival, which starts to cultivate talent for the Olympic team eventually. Uh -huh. And so there were a lot of goods that came out of that. Um, but again, and my story is probably not for everybody. Um, <laughs> There was, there was a guy who was freshman of the year before me, mm -hmm. and it was clear he was 6'8", just a grown man already. I matured late, right. and for us to win those championships that our coach wanted to win, it was going to be through him. Right. And that just didn't, that shit wasn't what I was about. <laughs> <laughs> so, you wanted to shoot him. Yeah, I wanted, and plus, you know, I had, I had been rookie of the year, and there was always... University of Miami. My dad was an associate right. AD there for like 17 years. Mm -hmm. And it, it was where I wanted to be. Like and I, you? Your dad was yeah. an associate AD? Mm -hmm. Really? I wanted to be a cane for life. Like that's, I grew up a cane. I wanted to be a cane. And so as I played my way into like maybe being able to be at a bigger school, mm -hmm. that, that equation didn't make sense for me anymore. To sit behind somebody like if I could go to maybe a bigger school, you know? Did you um, look at you coming out of high school? 
You nah. wasn't great in basketball? Not really. Nah. nah. Ham, Ham, and I'd be in Ham's gym all the time. Ham, Stan Jones. Um, you know, they used to have that little window up in the in the Hex Center. Yeah. <laughs> Busting their ass. Like, just... <laughs> Just sure making it a point, whoever <laughs> I can get in my sights. But uh, no, nah, they didn't. I think my dad was really too close to the program, and he didn't really feel like ultimately I'd I'd, I'd be able to concentrate on what yeah. he was saying. Right. It was the wrong sentiment because my dad would have let it be. But I think that's what happened. I never really yeah. verified. Your dad was play ball. My dad played football at Morehouse. I remember playing hoop it up, and um, it was a big ruckus on the court. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we were like, we're in Frog, we always have our hooping up to you. And we went over there, the police was over there and shit. And Frog was like, man, that's Roger Dad, man. He over there wilding. That's about right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's about, about right. right. That's about right. If uh, he played shit, he played me until maybe my sophomore year in college. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we, we would go at it. At it. Really? And then I got a little too big, a little too strong after For him? Year. Yeah, but he we went at it. What did he instill in you, bro? Because you and your sister, too, are the tougher. Basketball players I saw in my life. You beat your sister up a lot. Tell I, the truth. I appreciate that. Yeah, she got she. Hey, listen, I didn't have a brother, so that's where it went. You yeah, know? yeah. You could. She was. She was cut from a different cloth. Right. Yeah. Um. But what did your daddy instill in you guys to? You know, was it, I don't even know if it was that. Like, it had to be something because, like I said, you were the same guy, no matter what the pressure was. Yeah, I think you know. I watched. I grew up watching my dad in men's leagues. He was a coach. Mm -hmm. And so I was the little dude on the back of the bus or hanging out on the end of the bench listening to what was being said to his teams. And so it was always about competing, yeah. right? And, and you know, showing no fear in the face of what it was. And then, you know, if you were going to do something in our house, you wanted to do it to the best of your ability. It was no half-assing. So, right. you know, whatever that was that you decided was for you, we were expected to give it what we had. Right. And, you know, I've seen my dad in the hoop it ups and I've seen him in, <laughs> in men's leagues at 50 years old, like, you know, sometimes to a fault, same with me, but like, yeah. there couldn't be any back down because, you know, if, if you give somebody an inch, right. they're going to take it all. So right, right, right. that's just kind of the way we were raised to compete. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, for the, I, I tell, I try to tell my boys all the time. I got three of them. Um, my daughter's a little young that, it, my sister was Gatorade Player of the Year in the state. Mm -hmm. I was good, but she was <laughs> she was really good. And so she, you know, she was just extra on top of me because she got it from me and my dad. Right. Right. And you you could you could see it. Her focus wasn't that of a girl. Like her focus and her control of a basketball court was like she was something else. Like she was one of us. Like, <laughs> like yeah, she played she played mean. She was a mean. Right. Like, she played mean and tough and. And physical, you know, for, yeah. for for the basketball scene at that time, like she was ahead of her time with, you, you, with the you physicality. Hit her head right yeah. now. She was, she was. All right, all right. So, be, so it came from dad. Mm -hmm. It came from you sitting in the back of a bus. That's where it came from. Yeah, yeah. soaking it all mm -hmm. in. And 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 a lot of what kids get at those three, four, five, six early ages is what kind of what they turn out to be. Right. Um, so that's what you knew sports to be. They were trying to get your dad to do it. You, it was, oh, this is what it is. This is how I learned it. It's life. Right, right. right. This is how I learned it. So you leave Boston. You go to what, FIU? I went to FIU, yeah. And what happened at FIU? Man, Who's the coach? Shakey Rodriguez. Shakey Rodriguez. God bless. God bless Shake. Yeah. Shake was a legend. <laughs> I wanted to play for him in high school. It didn't uh -huh. work out. And then uh, we were playing, and they used to have the Farm Ed League, which was our, our pro-am. Yeah. And so I was down there. I had left Boston University. And I really wanted to go to Miami. Um, but Leonard Hamilton sat me down and he said, I have five pros. Like, if you come here, I'd have five pros and you wouldn't be one of them. So yeah. I don't know how. He told me that shit straight up. I said, hey. <laughs> okay. So, you know, he, he told me that. But Shakey saw me play in the Pro-Am. And he was like, look, you know, we, you played for me once in the little uh, AAU tournament. Yeah. Always kind of liked your game. We're going to try to lead the country in scoring yeah. this year. He was like, and, you know, I'm going to give you the ball and let you go. And, and this is what really sealed it, Damian McKnight, who mm -hmm. I had played against in high school and mm -hmm. knew really well, was coming back from Penn State. Um, uh, Darius Cook, who was at Northwestern, mm -hmm. uh, was at Dade, and he was coming over. And we just, Sam Watts was coming over, who was also at, at, at uh, damn, Northwestern. I think I was in the military. When it yeah. <laughs> so, but we had a bunch of cats coming back home. Right. And we were, we were going to try to lead the country in scoring. And, and really, he headhunted. He went out and found Michigan. And we went to Maryland. And we went to Alabama. And we went to Notre Dame. Yeah. Anyone who he could play, 
you know, we were going to play them. And that was kind of the way we were all underdogs and, right. and wanted it. So it spoke to me. How, how did it work out? It worked out great. I mean, we, we lost to College of Charleston my freshman year. In, I mean, uh, my first year there. in the, Charleston uh, was cold then, right? Yeah, they were top 20 in the country. I and, remember that running gun shit. Yeah, one of, the best, <laughs> one of the best environments. But we had to play them on their home court for the conference championship. Mm -hmm. And they beat us late in the game. And then uh, our senior year, we changed conferences. So it was up and down. Right. Uh, but I, was, I maintained, like, pretty good success. Scored the ball well. We had Carlos Arroyo. Mm -hmm. um, who, who at Damn, the time we, we had a pro backcourt yeah. in the tack and the Sun Belt. Right. People don't know that, but that's 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 rare in any level of college basketball. But yeah, so we were we were good and personally, you know, I, I did enough to, you know, open an eye or two. I didn't get right. invites to Portsmouth or Chicago, but I right. got I got a workout with the Hawks mm -hmm. and that kind of set it off for me. Yeah. And then, so then you end up going to uh, young kid, what was it? how you pronounce it, man? man Yakima. I went out to Yakima. <laughs> No, if you don't know where Yakima is, bro, Yakima is up in, in the state of Washington. Uh, you went into Seattle, and then you hopped on this little, like, eight- or ten-seater yeah. and went through, like, the rockiest plane ride I've ever been on, and then you come down into, into this valley, and people are super nice, but there is nothing in Yakima. So, you know, we lived in a, at a truck stop. It yeah. was the Best Western. You had a little mini fridge and a microwave, and they'll come pick you up in the mornings on a little bus, take you to practice, and bring you back and drop you off, and you do that again tomorrow. How long did that last? Um, shit, about six months. Six months. You Made a couple hundred dollars a week. You had to go off, though. Um, at first, I didn't. No? At first, listen, like, I try to tell this to kids, too. There are levels to everything. Mm -hmm. And... You know, some people can, but not everybody can switch levels and keep hopping up and, right. and hit the road running. Right. And I did not. Like, I, I sat that bench for the first for the first year. Uh, well, not year, but for the first quarter of that year, uh -huh. I sat the bench. I wasn't ready to play. And that's – I thought I was going to get drafted. And I'm sitting the bench in the CBA. In Yakima. Yeah, that's some shit. That's a wake-up call. So, <laughs> you know, it was good for me, though. I had to get I had to get my mind right. I had to figure out what, what type of work ethic – was required of me to get on the court there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, good lesson for kids. You know, you can't be too proud to go in that game. Like, even if it's for two minutes, you know, because that That's little two minutes. For kids. Yeah, dog, that little two minutes, you might do something and, and the cat, you know, sitting in the coach's seat, right. sees something in you. And so, you know, I just took little opportunities like that to get out there. Right. And, and it kind of snowballed and I was, you know, kind of all, I think I was rookie of the year maybe in the, in the league or something like that. How, you were there for two years? Yeah, I had to go back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to go back. I signed with San Antonio that summer. Okay. In, in summer league. I played pretty well. So I had, I had gotten the bread, but I, I just wasn't good enough to make their team. That was Tim Duncan and, you know, all the old heads. Shit. David Robinson, right. uh, Avery Johnson, they had the Jaron Jackson. The European guys already, too? They no, Ginobili came over after there. that. Okay. Um, but I'm talking about Sean Elliott, I mean, all of the right. OGs from the, from the Spurs. And so... They cut me um, and sent me back to the CBA, and I wound up breaking my leg like right before I was going to get called up. And so I, I really spent most of that first year I played with the Sixers. Yeah, I spent most of it here playing in the men's league with my dad. So let's back up a little bit. You thought you were getting drafted out of FIU? Oh yeah. Did you have a party and everything? Or did nope, you? I wasn't. No, <laughs> we weren't going to do that. But no, I had, <laughs> that workout I told you about with the yeah. with the Hawks. Uh -huh. um, they had told me that if they had they had like five picks in that draft, right. and one of them was the last pick in the draft. And if I was still sitting around at that point, they'd go ahead and take me. Right. They didn't have to because they knew what I didn't realize at the time. Well, nobody else knew who the fuck I was. So they didn't have to spend the pick on me. But we thought maybe there was a chance yeah. we'd get that last pick, yeah. Would you tell kids that are going through that situation, don't listen to none of that shit anybody's telling you? Why would you tell them to deal with it? It's a good question, right? Because... Yeah. I, you know, some of it you need to listen to because, mm -hmm. you know, if it's really lukewarm information and, and or it's lukewarm, like, feedback from, from teams and you right. have the option to maybe go back to school and, mm -hmm. you know, there are situations where I would listen to some of it just okay. to get a finger on the pulse right. of what people feel about you, right? right? Like, maybe you can go back and that stock rises next year. You don't have to come out. Mm -hmm. There are other situations where you got, you know, mouths to feed and you have to go regardless. So, yeah. to everyone their own their own you know I would just say that a lot of times when you're getting information you got to vet it right like you t you you can't just take what that man says because that man said it right like right. you got that information now go back and see if you can cross-reference that with something else <laughs> 
to get a clearer picture get of what's two happening. People to say the yeah, same thing. Correct, right. Correct. right, right, right. So what happened was I I was rehabbing here. I got a call and I went to uh, it was uh, the CBA folded. Yeah, CBA folded. The whole league folded. Holy shit. Yeah, it's crazy, man. It's a really crazy story. So they folded, and there was a new league with with some old CBA teams in it. And I got called by that league to go to uh, where were we? Sioux Falls, Idaho. Mm-hmm. So I was in Sioux Falls for a day. Uh, Randy Livingston was on my team. Mm-hmm. Um, um, what's Jamal's name, man? Jamal played for the for the Heat for a while. Jamal Robinson, okay. my buddy Carlos Daniel, and so I come to kind of help them. But I never played it a minute because I got a call the next day from the Sixers asking me to come up and uh, make a playoff run with them. So I never even got to play in that league. Really? Yeah. Al Iverson was on the Sixers team? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So you got called up to play in the playoffs with the Sixers. Mm -hmm. And this was when they faced the Lakers, right? This was 01. Another good lesson for kids, I tell uh-huh. them when I go speak at camp. The reason I got called up from the Sixers, I mean, clearly you had to be a decent player. Right. But Greg Popovich and Larry Brown were best friends, unbeknownst to me. And Larry Brown had gotten word from Popovich that I was a really good kid. There and, you that, go. and that I worked really hard mm-hmm. and that, you know, I'd be a good person right. to give a look to. Right. And that spoke to me because, you know, I always thought it was points and rebounds and assists and yeah. how well, and it wasn't any of that. My, I got a look because people thought I was a good dude. Right. And, you know, that's really important, especially when you're dealing with kids, to understand right, right, right. you burn those bridges and they can't be repaired sometimes. Explain good dude to kids. Um, when you say good dude, you mean that you went to a workout, didn't make the team, yeah. but he saw that maybe you were doing what you were very he, team, yeah, team oriented. He saw that I really wasn't there for my like it, I was there for myself, but I didn't project that. Like yeah. I wanted to make that team. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna front, right? And so there is an element of me caring about my own, but at the same time, I care about winning, and mm-hmm. I'll do what I need to do when you ask me to do it, right. even if it means not scoring, right? Because my role on this team could change from day to day. Yeah. And if I want to make your team, then I have to accept that right. and, and do what I need to do. So that was always the way I was taught. Um, secondly, like, I was there to work. So when Tim Duncan showed up, I was already in the gym. Like, mm-hmm. taped up, sweating, ready to go. Like, yeah. you know, when, when, when they left the gym, and this was by design, I wasn't leaving. Like, I would sit there and wait and shoot free throws and free throws and get extra work until that whole gym cleared out. And once they left, i get 10 more minutes, and then I could leave. So those were things. Plus, you know, when he cut me, I didn't really, you know, mm-hmm. act any kind of way about that. Because you really, in those moments, you have a decision to make. Like, right. am I going to act like an ass? Because I feel like I act <laughs> like an ass. I do. I really do. My heart's broken, and I feel like... <laughs> Or right. you go, you go, man up and and thank him and look him in the eye and you know do what yeah. you're supposed to do as a man. And so I, I checked those boxes and yeah. I didn't know, but ultimately. <laughs> you walked out there. Did you cry? Uh, I didn't cry, but I was because I had I got paid. If I if I hadn't got paid, I might have cried. <laughs> <laughs> I might have cried. <laughs> um, but no, I was I was just heartbroken again because I was really close and yeah. You, you, at that point, you think it's it's, it's done. Shit, you got the money, they can't cut you, and then they cut you. That that one hurt. That's that it is. Yeah, you didn't have a contract, you just got No, I had a contract. But still got cut. But still got cut. So <laughs> Did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you did you ever thought about giving up? Um yeah, absolutely. So going back to the CBA from that was really difficult. Because there's a lot of pride you gotta swallow. Because mm-hmm. you gotta understand the CBA is everybody looks just like you. We're all really good players, we all fell short of that ultimate goal. And we're all dropped in this little barrel, beating each other up to try to get out. Right. Like crabs. You know, we're just in there fighting, fighting, fighting to see who can get out the, out the barrel. And so when you get dropped back in it, you know, there's a lot of people looking at you. So, I told you he went by. You know, people looking at you. And so swallowing that pride and getting back to work was really difficult. Um, but it wasn't, I wasn't ready to quit yet. I was cool with that. Yeah. When I broke that leg right before I was going to get called up, mm-hmm. that, I thought about quitting. Because that was, it just felt like it wasn't supposed to happen. What kept you in it? Uh, my family, um, yeah. you know, ultimately, I, I, once I soul searched, I came home, I had some time because I couldn't do anything. Like, I realized that it meant too much to me. I had poured too much into it to yeah. really quit on it. Um, but, you know, having a good, solid foundation behind me of people that put things in perspective um, could really talk to me and get to the heart of why I was feeling the way I was feeling. That was important because yeah. it, it leveled me out. It grounded me and it allowed me to get to a spot where I could see the forest through the trees. Like, gotcha. that, that's what I want to do. So we can't quit now. 
Got you. You was able to see things more clearly. Mm-hmm. And you was like, well, this is what I am. That's it. Let's go. Then you get called up to the Sixers. I'm finna put this in your lap, bro. How long were you at the Sixers? <laughs> Before the playoffs started? Yeah. About two weeks. About two weeks. Yeah, two, three weeks, maybe. So you saw the playoff run. Yeah. Al Iverson was at practice, right? Every day. And for the fuck. I know you were late. before. Late. He was there late, but he was there. <laughs> but he was yeah, there. Yeah, he came in there late, but he was yeah. there, yeah. You, knowing Al Iverson, yeah. did we take that, did, 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 did the media take what he said and turn it into something else? About practice? Yeah. Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. Um, Chuck, like I said, like, Chuck, they set up a, a chair in the corner, not, not unlike that one, mm-hmm. and throw some Reeboks and hit some gear in the corner. <laughs> and the rest of us would be upstairs stretching or getting in our layup, whatever, whatever part of practice. It would be early. Now, he was right. never an hour late. Right. But Chuck would come in, go get dressed in the corner, and he'd join the drill. So it wasn't like he was the consummate pro in terms of being there on time and any of that, right? right. I want to be clear, right? I love Chuck, though, but I'm, I'm going to keep it a buck. You call it, Chuck is Iverson. I, Iverson, so yeah. You call him yeah. Chuck. That's yeah. when you know him. Fuck his Chuck. Like, eh. Right. All right, so. But when he, when he got there, he went to work. Like, there was no questions. Like, it wasn't like he just, you know, bullshitted through a whole practice. Like, he right. came in to hoop when he got to practice. He just wasn't on time all the time at practice. <laughs> You were great. Led Florida in scoring. Yeah. You, were, you know what I'm saying? You were great. You worked really hard. Yeah. How good is somebody like Allen Iverson, talent-wise? You can't put that into words, bro. Right. That is that is. not everybody gets those gifts. That, right. That's that's as best I could put it. That right. shit is special. To <laughs> really? He's six, he is six feet tall on a good day with the top of his cornrows, like, without him being pressed down. And Six foot tall on yeah, the basketball court. Maybe a buck, seven. And he's small. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this was a day and an age in the NBA where the space, but right now no one is inside the three-point line unless you got the ball in your hand. Right. At that point in time, everybody was not only inside the three-point line, but more than likely in the paint. Yeah. And there were two seven-footers on the court at all times, uh-huh. and they weighed 250, 260. So it was designed to be a physical, mm-hmm. value, beat you up type of game. And that little dude made a living leading the league and scoring in that. In the middle of all that. In the middle of all of that shit. <laughs> <laughs> and is, was it speed? Was it tenacity? Or was it just something he was born with that? Yeah, he, had, he was born with real gifts. Right. I mean, he was an incredible football player. Mm-hmm. Um, he was an, an artist, like the type of cat that, you know, could sing just about every song, like, you know, could do different. He, he had real talent oozing out of him, but um, he had electrifying quickness. Um, he had a, 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 like, silly ability to get to a point, stop, and go straight up in the air mm-hmm. before, like, you know, yeah. it's lateral and then it's vertical really quickly. Yeah. Um, and then some people are blessed with gifts to see things in a way other people can't. Yeah. You know, like, Steve Nash I played with, too. Like, he's he's... I could try to teach you how to play pick and roll. Right. But I can't teach you to see what he sees. The Those art, are that's art. he sees it it's doing art. different. Yeah. 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 No. No, no, I, I get exactly what you're saying. Um it, it's their art. Um we went to Vegas when I was a uh, senior with with Roko and Noah. Yeah. And and this is I didn't know uh, we all thought we had aspirations to play in the NBA. We didn't know fucking and we played against a guy, 5'10", named Prince Filer, mm. out, of, um, out of Nevada. Yeah. He ended up going to TCU. And he was averaging 60 points in the tournament. And we didn't understand. We was like, he's fucking 5'10". Like, we finna crush him because we were a team team. Sure. We didn't give a fuck. You yeah. know what I'm saying? We, no, I remember we y'all. Deal, y'all had a good y'all We beat up Chauncey Billups. We beat mm-hmm. up a lot of motherfuckers. But you said he was able to go forward and lateral and, and up. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Instantly. And it was something. We held him to 36 points. You held him to it. The defense when he came across the court was street, KJ's garden. When you come across the court, just leave your man and run at him. Right. Because we couldn't do anything about him, um, do anything with it. And when I saw him, I knew for a fact I was nowhere near an NBA <laughs> player. So, you know what I'm saying? It yeah. was like what we just saw at Elian, though. We just played against yeah. something that, and, and we've been playing basketball all our life. Never saw anything like Prince Fowler was. Yeah. So, so I get what you're saying, but I think some kids don't realize that, bro. You better work really hard because you're gonna get in the room. And oh. it's gonna be, it's gonna be fucking. You know, bro. Like, <laughs> hey, no, it's real talk because I had, yeah. like, literally had this conversation with two of my sons uh-huh. two days ago. Right. Um, about understanding that what you're talking about doing, mm-hmm. like, 
how many thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of other people are saying they want to do it. And even if you find yourself in a situation where you could say I'm the best in this little area, mm -hmm. if you're blessed enough to say that, hey, bro, wait till you get in the pool with the ones that are the best in their area. You know what I mean? Like it's, right. it's, it's really eye opening. And so, you know, your story about that would be, you know, my story about getting to the NBA, even through the CBA, I scored. Right. Like that was my job, like get the ball, go to work and then get into that NBA level and realizing, oh, you ain't gonna do that here. <laughs> like, no, nah, yeah, you're gonna figure something else out because that's not gonna be what you do. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of kids, they, they don't they don't realize that they, they don't realize that. So you got to the NBA and realized that, hey, man, I'm going to stay here somehow. And Look, you became what? Damn right. A defensive. Hey, I'm a guard. Allen Iverson. Every. So listen, man, this is it just worked out for me. But this is the way I approached it. I got in practice, I looked around, clearly I'm here by the skin of my teeth, right? It's late, I'm not supposed to be here. Um, there's no way that they're gonna use me for offense. And Allen Iverson on this team shoots all the shots. Yeah. So A, you better figure out something else that you can bring to the table. And B, like the best opportunity to show the coaches what that could be is to guard the little dude who's leading the nation, I mean, leading the, the league, league in scoring. And so I just guarded him every day. Like that was my, I'm, I, that's the best way for me to get from sitting on this bench to on the court. And even if I do it great, there's no guarantee, right? I'm on right. a 10-day. Yeah. But it was the only way I could figure out how I could make a mark to stay. And what came out of it? They threw me in a playoff game against the Milwaukee Bucks. <laughs> I sat through. I sat through the Pacers series. Uh -huh. I sat through. You remember that amazing Allen Iverson and Vince Carter series in 01? Yeah, yeah, when yeah. When seven, Vince went to get his degree and they lost. Right. Uh, he missed the shot. So I sat through that whole series. But... But Larry Brown would ask me, hey, can you guard Vince Carter? I'd be like, yeah, I got damn right I could guard him. <laughs> but yeah, I could guard him. So they didn't play me, but then we played the Bucks, And they had Ray Allen and Glenn Big Dog Robinson. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have an answer for Big Dog. We had Aaron McKee, Eric Snow. They could all kind of guard Ray. But nobody could guard Big Dog. Big Dog was like 6'9", right? Big Dog was like 6'8". Right. Um, big smooth, though. Yeah. Um, would play, you know, facing the basket. But if you... If you were under 6'5 and you didn't have a body, he put you, you on do his back. With right? him, he was so, big. so they put me in to play him. What yeah. the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> they put me in to play You're him. You're like, what, 6'4? Six, six, yeah, 6'5. Six, I was 6'5. Six, yeah, 6'5, six, and I was only about 215. Um, but I was raw and I didn't care. Man. You know? And there's something to be said about not giving a shit. All because you took the initiative to guard Adam Anderson in oh, practice. Yeah, that was it. All this just goes back to hard work. It goes back to hard work and not being afraid and 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 actually being selfless. Like fuck it, I'm a I'm a mid range shooter in high school. I'm a three point shooter in college. Yeah. Now I'm a defensive. So how did you do against Ben Robbins? He fucked you up. Uh, <laughs> at, at times, at times. But in real talk, I mean that particular game, um, we brought it back. We were down 25, I think, in Milwaukee. Maybe 30 was game six, I think. And we our bench like I got some steals uh -huh. and our bench ignited a little run so we got it down to like eight nine maybe I think I remember watching this game yeah but we didn't win it so yeah. that was game six um and so game seven I was sitting over there minding my business eating my Snickers bar like <laughs> usual you know and uh early in the game I heard my name I didn't pay no mind I thought somebody was just <laughs> and then they started hitting me hey hey so they sprang me up off the bench Late first quarter, something like that, in Philly, game seven. Yeah. And in game seven, bro. Game seven, dog. I had very little experience, but I got a steal on Big Dog, caught a dump, um, hit a three out of the corner, and then I had a, a drive down the lane where I kind of wiggled down while I was still driving the ball. <laughs> and I got a bump and finished over Irvin Johnson, and it sparked what became like a finals run. How did you explain it? I remember this. I remember yeah. watching the highlights on ESP. I remember. I remember. And I remember not being surprised yeah. because I, I knew was. how hard. <laughs> no, bro. No, I was. it's hard to see. Your... <laughs> see, it's hard to see yourself. Right. Yeah. But other people can see. Yeah, other people can see how hard. Fair. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And I, I just remember we just knew how hard you worked, bro. Um, like me and Frog made that decision. I told you in Jacksonville in high school. We was like, holy shit, dog, Roger. Yeah. Is on some other shit. Like he don't care. He ain't afraid. I didn't care. <laughs> I did not care. I still don't. But you know what? I will say to that because this is this is a crib show, right? Yeah. Yeah. That shit is forged in Dade County, right. Broward County, them little boxes of gyms that we grew up in, right. the parks that we that we battled on. Our area doesn't give a fuck. 
Right. And that's the essence of who we are. So like we can't forget that. Like mm -hmm. when kids get like nice with all and all of that, you can't forget about what that's about. Like Udonis, yeah. Udonis was a baby when we were in the gyms. Right. But he represents like that is what Miami Stevie Blake. Yeah. Stevie Blake was a baby in those gyms. Right. But all those cats went out and they were they represented the way that I tried to represent. Like right. we don't give a fuck. Right. And don't bring that shit this way. Right. And that's the way we did it. And this is coming from somebody who's traveled across the country and played ball. You see guys from different places. Mm -hmm. They come, some of them are talented, some of them, but they all don't have that. It's in football too. They don't have that. They hadn't had to go at it from eight, nine, 10, 11, right. you know what I'm saying? In and, 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 and these battles. Sometimes they were the best guy in the fucking city. Um, no, no, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a good, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, so, so what happened after that? Now you, that's on a big stage. Everybody saw that. Yeah. Did you feel like you made it at that point? Um, it was hard not to because the city was on fire. Uh -huh. My parents were there. We go in the mall and people would, I'm, I'm talking about hundreds of people would swarm, swarm me and it, it was, uh, Damn, bro, you did make it. Yeah. I thought, <laughs> no, but I mean, cautionary tale, right? Like in my mind, yeah, I made it. Right. So we go to the finals and you know, I'm now playing real minutes in the finals against Kobe. And, and Shaq, and we lost, but you know my star having been like out of the league three months ago, or out of any league yeah. to there, like I thought I had arrived. And I went to summer league, and I led it in scoring, and everything was love. Like, yeah. But I took my foot off the gas. Right. And so when I came back that next year, I wasn't as tight as I was supposed to be. And really? Yeah, I just wasn't, man. It's, it's you know, but these are all life lessons, you know. Like, what, what happened? Sat. Allen Iverson was back, Eric Snow was back, and I wasn't exactly what, what Larry Brown thought I should be in year two, so I sat. So how did it end? It ended by him like telling me good luck. Really? Yeah, good luck, and that uh, you know I wasn't gonna be back with the Sixers after that year. We lost to Boston, and uh, you know I sat around that whole summer. I didn't get an NBA call, so I went to Spain. You guys went to the finals to play against the Lakers. Yep. Did you guard Kobe? Oh yeah. How did you do against Kobe? Okay, I mean, yeah. as good as as good as anyone could do, like on a stage like that, without much preparation against the best player on the planet. Like yeah. I had, I had a couple moments where I get him, I ripped him in the open court a few times and stuff like that. But he he basically destroyed me like he did everybody. <laughs> but but you would always from that point forward, you would always guard him. Like they would push. Oh yeah, him. yeah, yeah. That was did anybody ever call you the Kobe stopper? Yeah, but I don't, I don't. Yeah, that, I mean, some people would try to, but that's not. That's based in all fiction. Like that's not even. <laughs> it's based in fiction. Come on, dog. That's not even. I mean, I'm I'm under no disillusion that that's, you know. <laughs> but Kobe was an apex predator. Yeah. And I've considered myself defensively, like once I really bought into it, right. an apex predator. And so we had to see each other. And yeah. You know, like. My job, and that's a lonely feeling. Like, like that defensive job yeah. in the NBA, when you have to guard the best players, you know, on their respective teams every night, that can right. get real lonely. But it's what was keeping my, you know, food on my table. So yeah. it was either going to be you or me. And somewhere in the middle of that, even though it was him way more often than it was me, I think people found some respect for the effort and not yeah. backing down from it. Can you dig what I'm saying? Like, no, of course. Maybe of course. not. Maybe not locking him up. But maybe holding him to, you know, 22 or making him shoot 35 shots to get his 33 or right. whatever that looked like, people found a little respect for the effort. So, so tell me, because Frog is my best friend. He's grew up coaching <laughs> basketball. He, he says the great offensive guys yeah. can't stop him. There's nothing you can do with him. But what could you do on a stat sheet to Kobe to be like, okay, well, at least we made him blase, blase. Yeah, for sure. Um, first, I, I want to make you work. Yeah. So, like, I'm not giving you the free catch, you know, like, because every little ounce of energy I could get you to expend, uh -huh. I think it pays off down the stretch when you got to hit the big shot. Right. So, I'm going to get you off your spot, make you catch it four or five feet out, change the math on, right. on the way, you know, your angles okay. and stuff like that. Um, deny the hell out of you if you give it up, make you figure out another way to get it, right. keep you out of your comfort zone. And then secondly, um, I want to keep you off that free throw line because those are gifts. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, you don't want to foul you. I don't want to foul you. I yeah. will foul you, right. but <laughs> I mean, I don't want to foul you. So right. if I can keep you from getting the free ones and make you work for everything you're going to get, uh -huh. like I feel like I'm, I'm winning at least in, in the battle that I have to attack that night. And then right. the last part of it 
is getting him to shoot a much lower percentage or a higher volume of shots to get his buckets. Because yeah. if, you know, even if he gets 40 and it took him 37 shots to get it, mm -hmm. that's a bunch of shots that Shaq doesn't get. That's a bunch of wide open shots right, that right, somebody right, else right. didn't get. And so there are instances where I could get cooked like that for 40, yeah. but he shot 37 to get him and we win. And that sucks because people are going to say <laughs> I got cooked, but I did my job. You what know does what the mean? coach say? The coach sees this. Deep. Mike D'Antoni and I, once I got to Phoenix, were in, were in alignment with that. Yeah. There were times where he was in a good groove and we needed to double him because he was efficient. I wasn't getting the job done. And we had to get it out of his hands. Right. And there were other situations where he'd look at me and be like, and I knew I wasn't getting any help because we had him locked into like this mano y mano and what he cared about was busting my ass. And if we could get him to do that, yeah. we felt like we could, we could win the game. Oh, really? Yeah. Bro, what does that feel like? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, what does that feel like? Kobe's like, yeah. kill his like, Hey, it's, it's life. Um, <laughs> he says it's life. It's life. It was mine. <laughs> <laughs> he says life. You know, that is, uh, it's a villain role. Yeah. Everybody, people want to see Kobe score buckets. Right. People want to see all the greats score buckets. And so, when you get cast in the role I was casting, you're the villain. But you learn to love that. And so... That was the space I operated in. When I came into the building, especially the Lakers building, um, I had some of my best nights in there, even offensively. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, another decent lesson for kids playing basketball. Like, if you dive in, if you're hunting buckets mm -hmm. sometimes, right. it becomes hard to get buckets. But if you'll dive into some other part of the game and give that, like, submit to that. Let the game come to you. That, you'll find the buckets. And so that's kind of what would happen with me and Kobe. Like, I would just dive into, like, guarding the shit out of him. And I wind up finding buckets. That is so hard for people to do that. Oh, yeah. As, so, even though you were defensive specialist, when that ball came to you, you still were ready to shoot? Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, in, you know, again, this goes back to roles right. and people understanding them. In right. Philly, that wasn't my job. Only shoot went open. Gotcha. You know? Um, in Dallas, I played on a, a Mavs team that was loaded with Dirk and Michael Finley and uh, Steve Nash and Walt Williams, Nick Van Exel. We lost to in the Western Conference Finals uh -huh. in 03. Again, only shoot went open. Right. But then I got to Utah and I got to Phoenix and my role expanded. And so, yeah, at that point I was hunt I was looking for buckets. Now, right. it wasn't, I wasn't the first option, but when that thing got to me, yeah. let's go. <laughs> You're going up with yeah. it. <laughs> my name's Chase Smith. I'm from Palm Bay, Florida. And this is Edge, the best tasting energy drink on the planet. So I'm going to read this. It says, Bell called Kobe a pompous and arrogant individual and have no respect for him. You said that to the media? Yeah, I said that to the media. Yeah. What were you thinking? Um, I really felt like that at the time. Like, I, you know, I, look, man, the, the interpretation I had, the way I viewed our situation was, you know, some people think that <laughs> what happens on the court is real life. Right. And that's not real life. No. Like, that's a production. That's entertainment. <laughs> right. But once these lights go off and the refs aren't here, like there are real ramifications for what's going on in the game, in my mind, in my mind. That's the way I approach it. So I felt like Kobe's life to him was like a movie where he was just living in this world where he didn't think somebody was gonna touch him. And he had shot me a lot of bows to the face yeah. and it was a lot of reckless talk and I had had enough. And so at that time, that's what was coming out of my mouth to the media. So, it's cameras everywhere, right? Nobody see these bowls? Oh, they see them, but, they, but like we, I mean, they're there. The right. people, you know, look, again, I'm casting the villain bowl. I understand that. Right. That, that still doesn't mean, like, that these teeth need to get knocked out, right? So, like, like I can accept my station in, in the movie, but I just felt like at some point... He was disrespecting you on that court. Yeah. And... And when it was 2005, Phoenix, Game 5? 06. 06. Yeah. In, in Game 5. It came to a head. You wasn't trying to stop him. You was trying to close line. Yeah, there was no thought process with that. Like, when I saw him going, um, we had, so what had happened was if we take it back, like, yeah, yeah. five or six minutes in that game, uh -huh. we, had, we, we had had the conversation, he and I, about it. I had had it with the refs. And then something popped off where him and Steve got into it. And I was standing there, and I got into it. And, and we, he started talking reckless. And then, you know, it got broken up, like most NBA things do. Like, boom, somebody stepped in, and we had to keep it moving. And so, yo, when he went, 
That's all I, that's all I had. I couldn't really, you know, in the middle of like me frying out and doing that, yeah. I didn't realize I was going to get suspended. <laughs> Can you do what I'm saying? Like, that's how crazy it was for me. Like, I was so gone that I didn't realize I was going to get suspended, right? So, um, I did what I did. And I, I thought, you know, I get kicked out of the game and not realize. Was not it realize. frustration or was it? It was, it was, it was anger, I think. Maybe, maybe a little frustration that I wasn't getting the calls. Mm -hmm. Like, and they were going to let that keep happening. Um, and then, real talk, like, I just, I wanted to get up and square up. And he, so you wanted to fight him? Oh, I wanted to fight him. Yeah, TV yeah, front of God yeah, and everybody absolutely, runs him. Absolutely. But that's where I was. Like, Got I can it. tell you right now that that was not a good idea. But at the time, that's where I was with that. And I found it really interesting. And Kobe and I, like, everyone loves Kobe. And I love Kobe because Kobe and I became really good friends. That's the crazy part. Like, right? we became really good right, friends. Right, right, right. Um, but at the time, like, when that happened, we were trying to figure out what our relationship was going to be. And Kobe, like a lot of greats, like MJ. Right. Like, they got bully personalities. Mm -hmm. So if you let them, they'll bully you. They'll bully you. And so, shoot in your face. Yeah. That's, so that's all bad. We, we couldn't let any of <laughs> right. that happen or we couldn't let it go any further. So, you know, he didn't get up and square up. He kind of got up and did something, you know, like that. And then I found real interesting that none of his teammates, if you ever see that happen to, like, a, a star player, you get immediate reaction from four other dudes on the court and their bench. <laughs> Go watch that clip. I said, no, I watched it eight nobody, times last night. <laughs> nobody ran up. Nobody did nothing. Nobody did a thing. Why do you think so? I don't know. But I found it interesting. Like, what, like replaying it and, you know, trying to go back in the moment, I found that interesting because no, nobody. Yeah, you were supposed to got, yeah. Somebody was supposed to come <laughs> over there and, and do something. Right, right. You got suspended how long? A game. A game? A game. And my, uh, my teammates held it down because I could have cost us yeah. that series real easily. Would you do it again? Yep. Why? Yep, because it had to happen. There, I mean, that shit had to happen, right? Like, there are moments in life where I, I try to tell my kids, like, there are going to be repercussions for that, for what you have to do. Right. And you will have to live with those. That doesn't mean that doesn't have to be done. Right. And that shit had to be done. Bro, we're talking about Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest basketball players ever. And you felt in that moment as a man. Yeah. Nah, bro, you tripping. Yeah. As a, as a competitor, yeah. like, you know, as, as, as somebody who makes his living, like, strapping up and trying to defend, like, there's got to be a backbone somewhere, right? I can't just let you keep doing that, <laughs> right? So, yes, that had to happen. Now, you know, what I didn't realize was, you know, afterwards, you know, there's some cool stories that revolve around that. Kobe said in the press conference, he asked, like, he said maybe I wasn't hugged enough as a child. <laughs> he was like, hey, listen, the brother was really witty, really funny. Like, yeah, he was, social. like, Kobe. Instagram should have been around. Yeah, no, <laughs> Kobe, was, Kobe was cool, man. But, but anyway, so he hit me with that in the media. I said something about an octagon. Like, he said something about not needing it. Or I said, we don't need an octagon. It was, it was going back and forth through the media. And then my mom caught him after we won game seven. He didn't, he didn't know who my mom was. Really? So we were in the bowels. They were in the bowels of the arena. I was not there. I was in the locker room. And he was kind of walking with his head down through the arena. My mom was outside the family room because they had to pass the family room. And uh, he, she said, hey, uh, Mr. Brian, Kobe. And he, he turned around and he said something to her. And she said, uh, I, I'm Roger's mom. And I don't know what he said to her because I wasn't there. This came from the, uh -huh. the people working the room. And she said to him, hey, could you use a hug? And he, <laughs> he just kind of dropped his head and walked away. So my mom got him. And then I saw him. like I was still, look, we were leaving Staples Center the next year. I had had no interaction with him since uh -huh. then. We were leaving Staples Center the next year in a preseason game. And to leave, their locker room's way in front of me. Mm -hmm. So about 100 yards out, I see Kobe and some people come out of the locker room and start walking in front of me. We both got to go to the same place to catch the bus. So I'm walking faster because he's got company with him. Like, I'm, I'm ready to go. Like <laughs> A year later. <laughs> yeah, dog. No, we're a year later, but I haven't seen him, so I don't know where we're at. Right. So, like, I lightweight got the, the fist clenched. Like, if it's got to go, we got to go. And then I get closer to it, and I realize he's with his family, right? So I know yeah. that's not going to happen, right? right. Um, and I go to walk by him pretty briskly, and I, I hear my name called. Now I'm like, well, shit, maybe we got to do it. Right. So I turn back around <laughs> and... You got one thing on his mind. Yeah, <laughs> but he was cool in that moment. He right. was like, I can only hey, I want to introduce you to this, my mother-in-law. Like, this is, this is my wife. And from that day forward, Kobe and I were good. Right. But we had to have that moment. Yeah. Right? Like, for, our, for, for a, a relationship, 
right. two men, two competitors. Right, right. Understanding like this is this is not you can't go any further than this. Yes, you are a way better player and you are gonna be the greatest of all time possibly. Right. But this is the way I feel about it and we going this is where we're putting the line. And that's all that was. Did that in public, like did that did people ever come after you? Did people oh, anybody pissed at you? Man, I got death threats, I got People would be at the hotels, like like gang members would be at the hotels in L.A. Like we'd stay at different places, oh, <laughs> and I know not to leave because I see them over there doing their little thing at me and whatnot. Like I'd be walking the streets when we were in Beverly Hills. See, right. I, we weren't in Beverly Hills. I wasn't leaving the hotel. Right. But in Beverly Hills, <laughs> I would leave the hotel, and like you know, people would mf me and my family as we're walking the streets. So you you got all of that, but right. you know that's part of the, again. Part of the business, man. You're a villain. You know? <laughs> Did you guard him after that numerous times? Or oh yeah, we went at it for years after that. Like yeah. with Phoenix, um, you know, the next season I think my first son Dia was born in the middle of we. He was born the night before we played them in a closeout game, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, I had a really good moment with Kobe afterwards about my son and yeah. congratulatory and stuff like that. We had we had a lot of good moments, good and bad, but it was right. always respect after that, and so. Right. My last time I was a free agent, I got a call th the morning of free agency, and it was an unknown number. I was in the street in Long Island working out with my kids, and I picked it up. It was from Los Angeles, and it was Kobe. And, but it wasn't his number that I usually see, so I was like, who? Right. You know, but it was Kobe. And he said to me, he said, anybody who could clothesline me in a playoff game, I want them on my team. And he said, you know, the late, the, the, it was Miami was building their thing. Yeah. And he said, LeBron and D-Wade think that they – you know, we're building a super team up there, and I need to, you know, get the people I trust over here to kind of deal with that. And so, right. unfortunately, I, or fortunately for me, mm -hmm. I was still being offered more money in other places. Gotcha. And the Lakers didn't have a lot of money at that time, so I couldn't play for the Lakers. But we had got to a really good place, man. And, and you know, sometimes things have to happen. It doesn't mean that, right. you know, that's the end of your relationship. It could be the beginning, and that, and that was the beginning of one. No, no, no. That's a that's a that's a that's a great story, yeah. dog. Um, you transitioned into back office. You ended up working at Cleveland. Mm -hmm. What did you do for Cleveland? Yeah, I did a lot for Cleveland and nothing probably at the same time. <laughs> I was learning. I was really? there, yeah. I was there when LeBron LeBron's first year back. So it was yeah. LeBron, Kyrie, and Kevin Love. And you know, I was brought in by David Griffin, who was with us in Phoenix, to kind of learn all the, the, the responsibilities, um, yeah. represent him on, on the road trips with the team because uh, he didn't like to travel. So, you know, I would take care of all the stuff on the road yeah. that a GM would have to handle, run it by Griff, obviously, and then kind of do what I needed to do. Um, I scouted a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to learn that salary cap stuff, but yeah. honestly, man, that's really, it's that's really difficult. Yeah, and I didn't have enough time to really learn it. So, you know, I was trying to learn and figure out whether that was going to be a good – occupation for me to continue yeah. to try to uh, uh, work in and at the time my family was really young yeah. and it is a full time all day year round it's job too much, though. and I just couldn't yeah I couldn't do that were you there before LeBron came back or you were there when you came he was already there so yeah I had agreed to go mm -hmm. when uh, they drafted Andrew Wiggins I didn't know they were getting LeBron at the time okay and then they got LeBron so LeBron actually signed there before I moved up, gotcha. but I had agreed to go up before that. Yeah. At what point did you know he was coming back? So I got a, I mean, I got a call before the media did because Griff was, Griff was just really excited and asking whether or not, you know, people close to him thought that that was a good idea, right? Because Wiggins was number one pick in the draft. And, mm -hmm. and LeBron had had kind of the fallout with, with yeah. Cleveland and, and, uh, I mean, that was another, was it, what, dog, you get LeBron? Yes, do that. So <laughs> we got, uh, we got him back and um, I didn't, I didn't know how that was going to work because LeBron that year, I don't know if Miami fans remember it, but he had went through this vegan phase. So mm -hmm. when he got to I camp, remember. no, when he got to camp, he didn't look like himself. I remember. Yeah. He was like thinner, like he didn't have the same lift, like, you know, his body had gone through something that it had never gone through before in terms right. of you know, his diet and stuff. So he did, I didn't know that it was going to wind up being what that cool little run in, in, in Cleveland was. Yeah. No. What LeBron is doing to the NBA, you think it's good for the NBA? Like, the way he, he moves business-wise, he has a squad around him. Yeah. They can, they're fucking controlling, yeah. like, parts of the NBA. Right. How do you, how do you, how do you see that? I, got, I have mixed emotions. Uh -huh. um, I think purely from a fan standpoint, yeah. 
Um, if you're purely talking about teams, I don't think it's great, right? right? Because, you know, like the control, if you're purely a fan, you want that in the club, right? Because right. that gives them the most opportunity and flexibility to do what they want to do. As a former player, as a, as a black man, as, as someone that's been through that, I think it's fantastic. Right. Like he's, right. he's empowered um, a lot of people in his community. Um, he's got a bunch of great minds in his camp. Right. Um, and they've built, you know, a, 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 an empire that's really cool to watch. So yeah, yeah I can really respect that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Best red velvet cheesecake guy ever tastes. SendJuiceSweets.com. Go find out for yourself, bro. Good. Um, how many kids you got? I have four kids, man. I have three boys and, and a little girl. Basketball players and football players. Oh, that's a tough one, man. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one, man. Um, so my oldest is an eighth grader at Heritage. He is a football kid. Yeah. Um, he plays quarterback and he plays basketball. I'm praying that one day he comes back to want to be a basketball player. But right now he's a football player right. who plays basketball in basketball season. Um, my middle one is sixth grader who's just the opposite. He is a basketball player right. who happens to be good at playing football. Right. Um, and then my 10 year old, man, we're trying to, he's trying to figure it he's out. Trying to figure it yeah, out. Yeah, he's playing ball. He's going to soak it all up. It's <laughs> always so the young will soak it all up. Right. So you, you let him make that own decision. You don't force him either way or? Uh, you know what we say in our house is you got to play something. Yeah. Like you, whatever it is you play, I, I, you know, my dad's philosophy of whatever you do, you're going to do it to your best. Yeah. We subscribe to that. Right. So whatever you pick, like we're working at it, but you can pick it. Yeah. But we, we, my wife played at FIU, like she was a really good soccer player. Um, and I obviously played, our, my sister played, my dad played, her brother and sister both played in college. So we come from athletes and we gotta play something in our house. Right. Yeah. You remember where you were when you found out Kobe died? Oh, absolutely. Where were you? Yeah, I, you know, it was really eerie, man. And, and I, was, uh, I was on my way to the Miami Springs Rec Center I was shuttling my son, a dad, um, and probably five other kids in the back of my car mm -hmm. to another uh, AAU game. Right. We, were, we were doing the exact same thing Kobe and Gigi were doing that day. Right. We were riding around from gym to gym um, playing games. And so I got the call, or no, one of the kids in the back said, hey, coach, I think Kobe died. And I, you know, I said, man, cut that shit out, man. That's just not funny. Like, right. don't, don't do that. And, you know, I kept driving and then one of the other ones was like, I, well, here it is again. And so the dad that was sitting next to me looked it up and he's like, I said, look up on a reputable source, like see if that's. Right, right. And so it came across something and I, I called Steve Nash, who's a really good friend of mine. I said, Steve, cause he's in LA. At the time he was in LA. And I said, is, hey dog, is that? And he said, yeah, bro, that's. And so we got to that gym like four minutes later and my mom was at the gym and my dad was there and all the families and we all just cried. We just, we cried for, for 15 minutes, just outside in the parking lot. Right. Cause your mom even had interaction with your mom. Yeah. And they knew they, like she had interaction, but knew what he meant to me. And right. you know what I mean? And yeah. so it was just, I mean, heartbreaking dog. And the fact that we were on the same kind of grind that day, just mm -hmm. trying to get to a game. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. It, it was, it was deep. Yeah. No, no, no. I think everybody really remembers that man. And I don't, I don't I just wanted to get that out on camera. I didn't want to jog up any no, bad I mean, hey. <laughs> emotions. But listen, bro, appreciate you coming, man. I, so, I, I vowed to tell all these Miami stories, man. No, that's what's up, man. <laughs> all, uh, the circle is small, bro. I didn't realize how, how yeah, yeah, connected, yeah. but that's Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, up. no. I, I was always here, man. I just wasn't great. You know what I'm saying? I was the sixth man for New Orleans, but I saw you and I saw your career. Hey, don't let, it, don't, don't let him fool you. That was a damn good <laughs> New Orleans team, man. Damn good New Orleans team. Oh, uh, well, listen, man. We got Roger Bell, man. IOD squad. We're going to get up out of here. Make sure y'all like it. Sure. Hey, here we are, Club 4103, living on the edge in Miami Beach, Florida. Look at them, show them the view. Show them. If you don't live on the edge, you'll never see the view. The most successful people in life have what? An edge. An edge. Edge energy. Delicious and smooth with zero aftertaste. After the first sip, you know, edge is fire.
Welcome, Welcome to South Florida, the bottom of the clip, but a gun shine yeah, state. Delicious. 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 Delicious.